From our studios at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bentonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting, brought to you in part by Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corp. Saturday Morning Meeting covers Walmart, Sam's Club, and the consumer product companies that are represented on the racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Ridenauer, and our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices to help you as a supplier grow your business with the world's largest retailer. Thank you for joining us, and coming up today, I'll be talking with Kathy Deck from the University of Arkansas about economic trends and retail. And reviewing this week's top news stories with me are Julie James and Colby Beeland. But first, the headlines. Walmart has committed to improving in stocks this year, according to a recent Bloomberg report. An attendee at the recent Walmart year beginning meeting recorded some of Walmart's plans to keep the shelves filled, which include hiring more staff and controlling inventory growth. AdAge reports that Walmart is seeking to share its knowledge with suppliers to prevent wasteful ad spending. At the recent AdAge digital conference, Brian Monahan, VP of Marketing of Walmart.com, spoke of using technology not only to better manage Walmart's marketing efforts, but also to help suppliers optimize their own advertising campaigns. The U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is permitting a biased case to go forward, according to DallasNews.com. The case involves a former Walmart associate who is part of a larger class action lawsuit which charged Walmart with gender discrimination in promotion and salary determination practices. While that case, Betty Dukes versus Walmart Stores Incorporated, eventually stalled, the recent ruling will require the court to rehear plaintiff Stephanie Odell's case. While the media has been abuzz with news of Walmart's entry into the used video game market, the folks at GameStop aren't terribly concerned. In a recent blog post at GameStop's website, CEO Paul Raines stated that Walmart's decision to sell used video games actually draws attention to the secondary market, which is good for everyone's business. Bloomberg reports that Walmart has filed a federal lawsuit against Visa, charging the credit card company with fixing fees. Walmart originally dropped out of a larger settlement, choosing instead to pursue its case against Visa, arguing that the credit card fees caused enormous damage to Walmart's business between 2004 and 2012. Trinity Church Wall Street has filed a lawsuit against Walmart, charging the retailer is restricting distribution of proxy materials prior to shareholder meeting. MSN Money reports to the church, which objects to Walmart's sale of guns and offensive music, is advocating for a shareholder vote on tightening restrictions on gun and music sales. Got a sweet tooth? Well, you aren't alone. According to a recent article at Retailing Today, the confectionery industry is seeing huge growth this year. Last year's candy sales were $33.6 billion, with the chocolate market seeing the fastest growth. Makes you wonder if we'll see a corresponding trend in diet aids and exercise equipment. Check out Walmart and Supplier News as it's reported on walmartnewsnow.com. And we're joined now by our panel, Julie James from Hillshire Brands and Colby Beeland from K-Stack. Welcome, guys. Big news, Walmart wants to uh, put product back in stores and actually sell product and make $3 billion. Julie? Hmm. Yeah, um, well, finally, uh, it's good news. Uh, we know out of stocks have been, you know, a big situation or a big problem with uh, shoppers in particular. You know, you see a lot of the articles today talking about shoppers being disappointed and walking away with out of stocks. Um, we see it in our products. Um, you hear that one of the best ways to do that would probably be to employ some associates at the on the floor level to get those things restocked. Right. We've been talking about this for a while, about how they just have to put some labor back in the stores. We talked about you know Mike Duke going out. He's ending on a high note as he leaves. Doug McMillan coming in. If there's going to be any time, if there's ever going to be a chance for somebody to make this change, it says Doug comes in because you know you're going to take a hit in the financial markets when you start layering, uh, adding payroll back into it. Colby, uh, it's it's you know Doug is in the same position that the president of the United States is in. First a new president. New president. First 120 days are critical. The decisions that you make impact the stage for his career and what what his you know in game is going to be at Walmart. So uh, the opportunity is his. He's it appears chosen to add 20,000 associates to three billion dollars. You do the math on that. Uh, what do you think the average hourly rate for these 20,000 employees? Somewhere around 15 dollars an hour. Okay, so 15 times 40 dollars, 40 hours a week is 600 bucks. 600 times 52 is 31,000 and change. 31,000 times uh, 20,000 is around 620 million. So they're going to invest 620 million dollars in labor to gain 3 billion in sales. I take that return all day long. To get a return. Mm -hmm. And and you know put things in perspective. 3 billion sounds like a big number. I think it's extremely conservative. Walmart's annual U.S. sales are 280 billion. 
So you're talking basically 1% of Less sales. Than, just right at one, a little more than 1%, more than which 1%. I think is a conservative number. I think it's going to be, a, a, it can be a little higher than that. I think the problem becomes though, can suppliers keep up with that? I mean, if Walmart all of a sudden comes in and says, we're going to double your orders, yeah. how much lead time do suppliers need to ramp that up? Because I don't think we're going to see this next week. There will be certainly some suppliers who, as soon as Walmart sends the orders, they can process it, get it to the stores, and get it out there. Obviously, there's some delay in hiring these 20,000 people and getting them up to speed and understanding the Walmart culture. But can the suppliers keep up with that? I'm not worried near to the suppliers as I am Walmart. Where does it go? Right. The back rooms are a mess as they are. So where are they going to put this additional inventory? That, I mean, yeah, can the suppliers keep up? That's a part of the puzzle. But to me, the bigger part of the puzzle is what's going on in the back room and where does it go? Um, you know, the, the conversation exists today of tethering. So if which the Walmart to go, the new convenience store that just opened up is tethered to store 100, which is the, the super center across from the home office. And they're actually sharing inventory, sharing some of the payroll hours. I, to me, that, that logistically seems problematic in shrink. I mean, I was in asset protection at Walmart for a while, and I would be screaming because uh, you're transporting product from one store to the next. Uh, and so you have possibility for shrink. You also have had some of the added inventory because you don't know where that inventory is going to go or where it is. Where it As is, a supplier, right. do I have visibility to what's going on in, in the tethered store? Because if it all rolls up to one store number, store 100 in this case, how do I know what's down at the Walmart to go? Yeah, and what's interesting about that too is frozen and refrigerated product. You know, how are they going to get that there? How are they going to make sure things stay refrigerated at the right levels? And expiration dates, you know, in our products at Hillshire Brands, we have expiration dates. So where are those products sitting? Are they sitting somewhere in a small convenience store? And, you know, how is that all going to work when we get billed right. back about that product? Because we want to trace that and make sure we understand where those situations are. Who's going to be responsible for managing it? What system is going to manage it? Your supplier, do they have a system that you can see inventory as it goes down to the additional boxes? You know, who's going to, who's going to have visibility to that? I don't think the system exists today. No, I, that's a huge systemic change. So Now, a good thing on the other side is tethering, obviously going to grow comp store sales. You've got two boxes in this case that are reporting up to one. So I, I think you can't help but grow or at least see some increase in your comp store sales, which Walmart has struggled to get those comp store sales. So tethering may be a way of the future. I think there are some logistical concerns that they have to work through. And I, 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 the indication that I get as I talk to people across the street is that they are working on, on that and they have a plan. And uh, I guess they're planning to roll this out to more and more markets. So we'll see how that, how that goes. Well, you know, um, from a uh, category advisorship standpoint, for my, my advisors, you know, today when we look at a store's performance that's related about a particular modular, but if stores or if sales are tied to, let's say, store um, the Bentonville store, but it's really replenishing another store, but the modulars we're looking at is really about Bentonville, it's going to be a real misread about what that pro what that store sold. You know what I'm saying? When you're right. trying to manage the shelf inventory for that store. Yeah, inventory is being flowed to somewhere else. That's how, like, so you may have a facing count of two at store 100 and a facing count of one at the right. Walmart well, to know, go. Right. Well, how will you tie that? Yeah. Interesting, interesting question. Yeah. So, and I, I'm sure, like again, I'm sure they're working through that. I, I haven't heard. I do know that they're getting very close to rolling out retailing 2.0. And from the early indications and conversations that I've had, um, we should get results back in less than five seconds which if, for those of us who run reports on Mondays, you know you don't get it till late Monday afternoon, <laughs> Tuesday morning. Right. So that is exciting to see. But uh, from what I understand, there's a lot more visibility and a lot more bells and whistles in retailing 2.0. I'm trying to get somebody to come on and talk about that from Walmart and get a better understanding. My hope is that as that rolls out, we'll have visibility to these tethered stores and be able to understand where our products is, are, are in, as a supplier, which box are they in, I don't think they're to the point yet where we can tell if they're in the back room or they're in on the sales floor. That's coming, but I still have concerns about how they're going to flow in all this merchandise. What do they do with it, and how do we as suppliers know where it is and how it's selling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which it, you know, it's still a challenge today. You can ship all day long. It's if the product is getting out to the, sh the to the floor, <laughs> and you know, frankly, associates that really care that they're stocking it. Right. So having that level of um, engagement at the store level, you know, I think I think Doug's got, you know, I think it's fantastic he's back. I love it. He's got the old traditional Walmart ways. Yep. Um, you know, I hope he can get the associates back to feeling um, engaged into the business like Sam Walton always did. You know, that's the challenge with that many stores. How do you... 
how do you get that many associates caring that right. things are in stock? And owning that business. Yeah. I was talking to somebody this week who, who said, Doug has been hitting stores. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing some buyers really begin to make sure that those in stocks are there because now you have somebody like Doug who was a buyer mm -hmm. and who understands replenishment who can walk into a store and look at the tag and completely understand the supply chain for that product and understand the logistics that go into that, the reason that went into that. And so they haven't had that in a while, not taking anything away from Mike, not taking anything away from Bill, but here's somebody who grew up as a buyer and grew up in stores and understands it. Well, I think at this point, the plan seems to be set. Mm -hmm. Now it comes down to execution. Mm -hmm. Can they execute the plan and how quickly can they execute it to gain $3 billion? And is $3 billion a much larger number than that? I think it is. All right, guys, thank you very much. We have to leave it there. Stay tuned because when we come back, we'll talk with Kathy Deck from the University of Arkansas about the state of the economy on Saturday morning meeting. Bentonville Plaza, across the street from the Walmart home office, the best office location for businesses working with the world's largest retailer. Bentonville Plaza offers proximity and services like no other business complex in the area, including custom designed suites and an on-site fitness center and restaurant. Pre-leasing opportunities are currently available for new construction. Call 479-200-1112 today. Experience the unique cooling sensation of frozen yogurt. New Dial Frozen Yogurt Body Wash. Wrap your skin in cooling moisture for skin so refreshingly soft, people will notice. Dial, healthier skin, healthier you. K-Stack, the leader in collaborative retail consolidation programs. We offer the supply chain expertise needed to navigate the challenges of selling products with the world's largest retailers. And we provide customers with a customizable, scalable, environmentally sustainable supply chain with the same advanced technology typically used by larger rivals. By leveling the playing field, K-Stack lowers distribution costs and increases overall margins. K-Stack, retail logistics is what we do. The Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter Starlight Gala just got squared. Hot country couple Thompson Square will light up the John Q. Hammond Center Saturday, April 26th. It's a night of elegance, entertainment, and hope for abused kids to the power of two with amazing live and silent auctions and a chance to give abused kids hope for a better life. For sponsorship and ticket information, visit our website today. Be there April 26th and get square with KNWA and Fox 24. 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. When and where you want to learn. Current, accurate, relevant, taught by suppliers for suppliers. 8th and Walton. I would recommend 8th and Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training, and so 8th and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system. And again, because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why, so they become very valuable very quickly. And welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. We're joined now by Kathy Deck. She is the Director at the Center of Business Economic Research at the University of Arkansas. Kathy, thanks for joining us. Now, everybody here in Northwest Arkansas recognizes you as kind of the authority on the economy, and you get lots of media time from that. But let's talk about your background. How did you get into this? Well, I've been in Northwest Arkansas for 13 years now. I came to the University of Arkansas after living in Tucson, Arizona, where I was the antitrust economist for Attorney General Janet Napolitano. And what was really great about that experience is that I started looking at industries and markets and how products get to market and supply chains. And it's amazing how that, that introduction to, to the economics of the real world has come in so very handy here in Northwest Arkansas. Well, let's talk about some of those emerging, retail, or emerging trends that you're seeing in retail that really suppliers should be aware of, as well as uh, retailers, sp specifically Walmart and Sam's, but other retailers as well? Well, I think suppliers and, and uh, retailers are acutely aware of the, the overwhelming trends that are going on right now in terms of particularly income growth. Uh, when, when we look at the average consumer across the United States, that average consumer is really not seeing their income grow substantially. And so we do see retail sales growing over time. And when you say, well, incomes aren't growing and retail sales are growing, 
you scratch your head and say, well, how is that possible? And, and the answer, of course, is that we also see debt growing again. Uh, we kind of came out of the recession and we see consumers taking on debt. And as we talk about debt and we talk about retail in general, I mean, you see a lot of credit card offers out there. But right. let's talk about Walmart's impact on the national economy. And they're by far, they're the biggest, biggest store. And let's talk about Walmart's impact on the national economy. Well, it's hard to really overstate how important Walmart is to the national economy. Of course, it is a large employer in and of its own right uh, across the whole United States. But when you look at Walmart's basic philosophy on how it sells and to whom it sells and how much it sells, it is all about low prices and keeping those prices in a place where consumers can go out and, and, and achieve those goods. And because they have had so much of this downward pressure on prices, they've given the United States economy uh, really a lot of room uh, to grow. It, it gives the Federal Reserve, for example, who sets interest rate policy, room to keep interest rates low because prices aren't skyrocketing uh, for the average consumer. And as we keep inflation low, Walmart is a big part of that across the, across the domestic economy. When it, I want to come into this topic <laughs> about merging. Right. What threat do you see, what, what benefits do you see from that? I mean, that was your background. Um, and then what's the impact on Walmart? So back in my antitrust days, I would look at consumer harm and you would say, well, is there enough competition in the market to make sure that consumers are going to be able to, to go out and purchase and not just have a monopoly to buy from? As we know, there's a great deal of competition in the grocery market, not least of which from Walmart, right. um, not least of which from these other huge uh, grocery stores. Grocery stores have been challenged for, for many, many years, of course, with their, with their supply chains, their distribution, making sure that they have the margin uh, on their products. It's not a particularly wonderful uh, margin type business, which is why you do see this kind of consolidation, and we've seen it again and again uh, and again in the, in the grocery market. For consumers, um, when we, when we look and we say, well, what does it mean for, for these companies to merge? Well, obviously, it's, it's uh, fewer actual choices uh, out there from where they can get their groceries. But in fact, it may make these companies much stronger uh, so that they have the bargaining power to keep those prices lower. That impact on Walmart? Uh, the impact on Walmart, uh, it's quite clear that whenever you see a couple of competitors uh, merging together to be stronger, that Walmart's going to have to compete even, even, uh, even more acutely uh, with them. And so when, it's, when it goes to its suppliers for, for groceries, they're going to have uh, multiple places to, to get those, those products sold. Okay, consumer confidence, that seems to be something we're hearing a lot about. We've got about a minute before we have to go to commercial. So, so it's really interesting to think about consumer confidence along with this income story that I told earlier. So consumers, if you look before this most recent recession, consumers had average confidence around the level of 90, let's say. In this most recent expansion, and we've been expanding since 2009, consumer confidence is more like 75. And so consumer confidence has increased greatly from the bottom of the recession, but we just are much more pessimistic than we used to be. Is it pessimism or is it conservatism? And, and I say that meaning I'm not really going to go out and spend because... Yeah, I think it's pessimism about the future, to be honest. I think when you look at the components of what's going on, we just don't have the same belief that the future is going to be as bright and shiny uh, as we might have, say, back in 2005 or 2006. Okay. We're talking with Kathy Deck. She's the director for the Center of Research at the University of Arkansas. We are going to take a break. When we come back, we will continue our conversation at Saturday morning meeting. We'll be right back. Imagine what it would be like if you knew the weather up to a year in advance. What would you do differently for your business or your life? At Weather Trends, we don't imagine it, we do it. We're a team of meteorologists, mathematicians, and business weather advisors. And we've spent the last 20 years developing a new way to forecast months in advance. We've been studying weather's effect on product sales based on every one degree change in temperature. We can now take your sales data and show you exactly how the weather impacts your business down to a single degree. We're leading the way into a new era in forecasting and a new power in business decisions. And we invite you to join us. Welcome to Weather Trends. 
know, the biggest challenge of working with Walmart is they really expect everyone on the team to know their language, know their terminology, and know exactly how they do business. So that's where Ethan Walton really comes into play. You know, it's the fastest way to get my team members up to speed. Their business model is suppliers teaching suppliers. So when you come to Ethan Walton, you can count on having very experienced trainers who understand how suppliers work within Walmart, and they take advantage of that and incorporate that into their curriculum. Beaver Lake serves as the drinking water source for one in seven Arkansans. Did you know that your actions can impact the quality of water in Beaver Lake? The Beaver Watershed Alliance is working to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality of Beaver Lake. With the help of partners, volunteers, and people like you, the Alliance is making a difference in Northwest Arkansas. Please learn more about your role in preserving the water quality of the Beaver Watershed and about how you can get actively involved. Visit beaverwatershedalliance.org. Beaver Watershed, our environment, our health, our home. Are you a single parent struggling to meet your family's needs? Single Parent Scholarship Fund is here to help. Single Parent Scholarship Fund of Northwest Arkansas helps hundreds of single parents get an education. By providing scholarships and support, a brighter future is right around the corner for you and your family. We should know, in 2007, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in organizational management. Single Parent Scholarship Fund helped make my dream a reality. My kids are so proud of me, and now they declare themselves as college bound. And welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. We're talking with Kathy Deck. She is the Director for the Center of Business and Economic Development at the University of Arkansas. Now, Kathy, before we went to break, we are talking about consumer confidence, and it's around 75. Right. Is that, I mean, 75 typically is average if you look at grades, but. Right. So it, it doesn't mean anything to it. The normal person to say, oh, consumer confidence is at this level. What we do know is that it's substantially lower than it was in the last uh, expansion. And we are in an expansion. Uh, the recession ended in 2009. Recession is defined, of course, as two consecutive quarters of negative growth in the economy. And we have been seeing... Even if it's one-tenth of a percent. Even if it's one-tenth of a percent, percent or hundred percent, that's not a recession. It is growth. And we have seen tepid, not good enough kind of uh, plotting growth since 2009. It's just not quick enough to get that employment level back up to where it was uh, pre-recession. So in your opinion, what is the reason that we're seeing this hindrance to that growth in the economy? Because you hear, you know, if you talk to some national, or you listen to national pundits, so Obamacare comes up Absolutely. consistently. But what are some things that you're seeing? Well, I think you have to look at the demographics of, of our situation now. Our demographics in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s in the United States were spectacular. You had the baby boomers, this huge generation of people entering their most productive years. When you look at where we are right now, we would expect to see the baby boomers begin to retire. We've known this was coming for a right. while. We're at a place in our country's history demographically where it's a little bit, it's, not as, it's certainly not as wonderful of a growth environment over the next decade as it was, say, a decade ago. Okay. When you combine that with the timing of the recession, it, it all was compounded upon itself. And so right now we're still seeing the effects of the long-term unemployment from the recession and then the natural effects of the, the baby boomers retiring as we knew they would. And look, but what's, what do you see as the hind Is there another hindrance in that? Well, there, there are a couple of things. So, it's all about jobs, and it's all about the wages you get at jobs. And okay. so when consumers are, or when, when, when workers are able to say, I'm being very productive, and go to their boss and say, boss, look how productive I am, right. I, need a, I need a raise, then they're empowered, their confidence is high, and they spend money, right? That is not where employers are right now, or with employees right with, now. Well, and with unemployment being where it is. That's right. I don't. If you're going to push, I may, I may not need you. I can go find somebody else. That's right. Unemployment is still uh, elevated, although it has come down substantially. And it's not, it's not clear sometimes that uh, the skills of the people who are still unemployed are the ones that the employers are, are, are looking for by and large. Well, and employers can be far more selective because there's a bigger... Ab abso pool. Absolutely. And so it's very difficult for any employee to go to the boss and say, I'm a wonderful economist. Pay right. up. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to do that right now. And so we, because that's not happening, they're not seeing incomes rise because we're not seeing incomes rise for the average consumer again. Um, all of the retailers are, are having to deal with that pie existing just as it is and, and trying to get the, the most well, of that there's pie. There's been a lot of talk can. now about minimum wage increases. Yes. And to your point here. And Arkansas is moving to do that. Mm -hmm. um, or they're, they're trying to. Obviously, President Obama is trying to do right. that. What are the impacts that you see with that? So the whole reason one would try to increase a minimum wage is to get exactly at this problem that we've been talking about, that wages aren't growing for average consumers. Now, 
very a very low percentage of actual workers are actually tied to the minimum wage. We're all, there, there's, of course, the continuum uh, that, that we look at. Right. But the idea is to do something that gives employees some leverage. Most economists agree that increasing the minimum wage is not the most effective way to do that. We could say increase the earned income tax credit or something else that would put right. more money in consumers' pockets. Uh, but the reason that we even have this discussion about, well, should we increase the minimum wage, is because we want, in fact, consumers to have more money so they can go shopping. But it's also a tax increase, right? Well, taxes will increase, but I, I have to say that taxes increasing because wages are higher is kind of the best reason for taxes to increase. We would like to see that happen from an organic market-based, uh, for an organic market-based reason, rather than us having to go in regulatorily and, and fix things. And minimum wage increases, as you said, they, they really impact a small number of people. Yes. But do the people who are already making close to minimum wage but above it, what's the impact on them? Well, it's differential. And so the, the whole thing about the minimum wage, it makes it so very difficult for an economist to say, yes, this is a good idea, or no, this is a terrible idea, is that the benefits and the costs don't accrue to the same people. Uh, and so the person who gets the raise and keeps their hours and keeps their job, clearly better off. Right. The employer who's paying them more uh, get, takes a hit to profitability or has to increase their prices. The average consumer, the average so consumer, increase. well, were they the people getting the wage or were they people paying the price? It's a, it's a, it's hard to you you go through and through and through and it's it's not clear uh, again that the benefits and, and costs are shared. All right, Kathy Deck, the director for the Center of Business and uh, Economic Research at the University of Arkansas. Kathy, thanks for coming in. Stay with us. We will have more on Saturday morning meeting when we come back. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. Discover our revolutionary lotion-infused body wash, New Dial Vitamin Boost, and wrap your skin in nourishing softness. For healthy, soft skin, people will notice. Dial. Healthier skin, healthier you. 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. When and where you want to learn. Current. Accurate. Relevant. Taught by suppliers. For suppliers. 8th and Walton. The Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter Starlight Gala just got squared. Hot country couple Thompson Square will light up the John Q. Hammond Center Saturday, April 26th. It's a night of elegance, entertainment, and hope for abused kids to the power of two with amazing live and silent auctions and a chance to give abused kids hope for a better life. For sponsorship and ticket information, visit our website today. Be there April 26th and get squared with KNWA and Fox 24. Are you a single parent struggling to meet your family's needs? Single Parent Scholarship Fund is here to help. Single Parent Scholarship Fund of Northwest Arkansas helps hundreds of single parents get an education. By providing scholarships and support, a brighter future is right around the corner for you and your family. We should know, in 2007, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in organizational management. Single Parent Scholarship Fund helped make my dream a reality. My kids are so proud of me, and now they declare themselves as college bound. I would recommend 8th and Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training and so 8th and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system and again because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why so they become very valuable very quickly. Our thanks to Kathy Deck from the University of Arkansas, and as always, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us Saturday at 8 and .com. and be sure to join us next week when we're going to talk about why giving back to the community is important to suppliers. Our featured guests will be Mary Zettel from General Mills and Jody Dilday from the Single Parent Scholarship Fund. I'm Derek Reidenauer, and from all of us at Saturday Morning Meeting, thanks for watching, and please join us next Saturday.